All right, so the number <laughs> of members of the audience uh, looks already quite constant. Uh, so let's start with this morning um, webinar. Mm, please uh, first allow me to introduce myself. My name is Petr Kusonia and I'm uh, currently a uh, scientific vice president of the European Federation of Chemical Engineering. EFC has been organizing uh, webinars uh, of this kind for the last two years. Now we have the third series. It appeared as a pure necessity because of the pandemic situation. And then when talking about it with Martin and with uh, other members of the board of uh, the European Federation, we realized that it's actually a very efficient tool how to share and disseminate information, latest, latest uh, knowledge, opinions within inside of our community, in, uh, even in the period when we expect that standard face-to-face -face meetings will be possible. So that's, that's uh, exactly the situation right now. We are happy that it's possible to meet face to face again, even with some with certain limits. But um, but we plan to extend the chance for 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 our members to take part on such events. Um, we are going to organize it again uh, in in the autumn. Right now, I'd like to express my thanks to Professor Julia Vazana, who is uh, who 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 brought to this uh, morning, uh, a very attractive uh, list of lectures. She organized uh, this webinar uh, coming from the Working Party, um, uh, which uh, we call CAPE. Uh, I'd like also to express my big thanks to Martin Pu. She is the head of the Secretariat of the Scientific Secretariat of uh, EFC for organizing all uh, webinars. Uh, for all interested working parties and sections. So that's all from me at the moment. Also, thanks to you uh, in the audience, uh, those who we can't see, but uh, without your participation and without your active role in the discussion later, this would not be uh, of the profit as we expect. So thanks a lot for being here. And now I'm passing the stage to, uh, to Julia. Thanks a lot. There is uh, uh, sorry I've got uh, some problems <laughs> with the computer. Yeah, all right. <laughs> so so for, for, I don't you, know why. But we can see you and we can hear you. Yeah, it was it was not charging. <laughs> okay. okay. I, right. <laughs> I don't know why. I've changed the the, the connection. Okay. okay. Welcome uh, to everybody, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, uh, to this session. Uh, I have to uh, inform you that uh, this session will be recorded and made available in the uh, European Federation of Chemical Engineers uh, YouTube channel. Uh, the participant will be not uh, allowed to uh, speak in this session, but you will be uh, allowed to write your questions in the chat. So at the end of each presentation, we will, uh, you will put your questions in the chat. I will read the questions to the speakers and they will answer to you, okay? Uh, my name is Giulia Bozzano, as uh, said to uh, by Petr, thank you Petr for your introduction. I'm from Polytechnic of Milano and I am the uh, secretary of the Computer Added Process Engineering uh, uh, Working Party. We have organized this uh, talk uh, by uh, taking into account the, the need, the global need that we have uh, in the world for the use of renewable resources, both for the production of fuels and the chemicals. So uh, the area or the research area is uh, very uh, huge uh, and aimed to find optimization process, optimized processes. Uh, both from a point of view of uh, economical uh, and, uh, and environmental point of view, uh, that can help us to uh, find the new routes for the production of fuels and, uh, um, and chemicals. Uh, good morning, everyone, and thank you for attending this talk. Thank you, Julia, for, for the introduction. Today we're going to be talking about a couple of uh, problems related to the, the processing of uh, biomass. So we can, we can consider two different kinds of problems. One 
when we are going to mix a number of ingredients in order to obtain a, a final product. This is uh, similar to the production and we are going to be using this as an example for the production of food from different uh, crops and so on. And the second one is uh, the, the fact that the biomass is a, can be considered as a, a, a mixture of different ingredients, such as uh, hemicellulose, cellulose, lignin, or in the case of algae, we have starch, we have lipids, we have protein, and we are going to process those in order to obtain uh, different products. But the, the, the interesting thing about this is how we can make use of of the full amount of biomass in the different compounds in order to uh, obtain high added value products or at least added value products. So uh, we are going to uh, start uh, with the second uh, kind of problem, the one we are, we are going to be using uh, a formulated uh, raw material, and we are going to consider examples from algae and uh, lignocellulosic biomass. So let's start, for example, with the production of biodiesel. A biodiesel actually requires uh, some alcohol. However, for some time, we were buying that alcohol from, uh, from uh, fossil fuels. So basically, the idea would be, can we use it, uh, can we produce that alcohol from the same raw material? And actually, it's something that we can do from the algae. We, uh, from the algae, we can uh, typically use uh, the, the lipids as a source for oil. However, we can also use the starch as a source for ethanol. So the idea would be, can we play with the composition of the algae so that this integrated facility operates at its best? So the idea would be basically either give guidelines for the growing of algae with a particular composition or, uh, of, uh, or selecting the algae that is uh, best for our system. So in order to do that, what we have to do basically is uh, we have to follow and model each one of the units, each one of the uh, steps that you can see on the slide, just as, uh, as a typical process so that we can uh, select. Basically, we are going to design the algae. We are going to select the composition of the algae that is going to be best for this integrated facility. We have to grow the algae. We are going to dehydrate that. We consider different strategies, uh, the typical one with drying or uh, the one with a, a belt dryer. We are going to extract the oil. And on the one hand, we have the oil for the, uh, for, for the transesterification and we are going to use the starch. Each one of these uh, units are model is uh, using an equation-based approach. For instance, for the uh, starch processing, we are going to go through hydrolysis, fermentation, dehydration, and in order to reduce the energy consumption, we are going to implement within the um, model a multi-head column. Let's uh, start and consider each one of the units just to as, a, as an example. So basically, we have a liquefaction, we have saccharification. We are going to be using experimental data from the literature in order to, uh, to model the yield of the different steps and also, of course, the, uh, the stoichiometry of the, the reaction that are happening. Once we have the glucose, we are going to ferment it. Actually, it's basically first generation uh, ethanol because we have uh, glucose. And uh, once we have the, the water ethanol uh, mixture, we go and implement a multi, uh, a multi effect uh, operating, uh, multi effect column basically with the, the main operating variable will be how much of, of the feed goes to each one of the columns and also the pressures and temperature of the high, medium and high pressure column so that uh, we can have energy integration within our system. Once we get the, the ethanol, we are going to use it to transferify the oil coming also from, from the algae. And uh, because of the variability, oh, sorry, because of the variables involved, the temperature, the pressure of the different uh, distillation columns, not only for the separation or purification of the, of the ethanol, but also here, uh, when after the transesterification, we have to recover the excess of, uh, of, of ethanol, we are going to uh, implement simultaneous optimization and heat integration so that we can control the excess of um, um, ethanol in the reactor and somehow reduce the energy consumption that is involved in the recovery. So apart from the first principle from, for most of the, of the units, 
and uh, rules of thumb in order to avoid the decomposition of different uh, of the oil or the uh, biodiesel or glycerol. We also have uh, uh, design of experiment kind of a, a surface model, a surface of response model for the reactor so that we can play with the um, variables that affect the equilibrium that uh, determine the conversion. So basically the, the thing is uh, here you can target very high conversion in this reactor, however, how, uh, how much is the cost? So uh, how much is the excess of ethanol required? And if it does, it's uh, uh, an interesting option. That's the reason for the simultaneous optimization and heat integration. So, uh, so with this, one of the, the interesting things that uh, we found is because of the high energy consumption uh, of the production of ethanol and of the basically of the dehydration of the ethanol, the algae is uh, suggested to, to have more or less 60% lipids, 40% carbohydrates and the rest protein. Basically, we are going to be producing the uh, ethanol that is required for the process, but not much, not, not, uh, not an excess. So we are not going to target in the production of ethanol for uh, as a final product, basically because it's uh, too expensive. We've seen an integrated facility for this, but we can go a little further. Basically, because uh, instead of uh, ethanol, we can produce methanol from uh, biogas. Biogas contains methan uh, methane and CO2. So basically, we, we have all the ingredients for a dry reforming to produce syngas. And syngas, as many of you uh, are familiar with, uh, is the uh, building blocks for most of the, uh, of the bulk chemicals, such as ethanol, DME, uh, methanol, or fissure tops. So basically what we are going to be working here is with an integrated facility that, that start with a uh, waste. We are going to digest that waste and we have two different products. On the one hand, we have the digestive that is going to be used as nutrients for the algae, uh, nitrogen, phosphorus, uh, and potassium. And uh, on the other hand, we are going to be using the biogas in order to produce the methanol that is needed. In the production of methanol, because of the CO2 available there, we are going to use it, uh, as you can see, to feed uh, the algae production, basically as a carbon source. We are going to break down the algae as before. And uh, with the lipids, uh, what we can do now is transesterify those lipids with, uh, with the methanol. So again, we have to go and model each one of the units uh, Using a, we use an equation base, but basically first principles, um, rules of thumb, experimental data, and so on and so forth. Basically, to uh, to be able to decide which are uh, which is the proper composition of the digestate, so that we can grow the algae that will allow us to uh, to operate this integrated facility. So uh, just uh, to mention a little bit of the units involved, we start here with the digestion. The digestion. Uh, produces the uh, biogas. With the biogas, we have to clean it up uh, from uh, sulfur hydride or ammonia. Uh, later, we have uh, a second step where we uh, where we have uh, the dry reformer. Uh, we produce the syngas. With the syngas, we have to adjust the composition for the production of uh, methanol, and uh, we consider reverse uh, water gas sieve, or um, if we have an, uh, an additional the production of uh, hydrogen, we have to remove it and adjust the final composition basically because we have to allow 6 to 8 percent uh, of CO2 in the final mixture. So uh, with this, we go to the methanol synthesis, but basically is uh, common in the uh, in the chemical industry. Uh, we have uh, it is governed by the equilibrium, but also there are some uh, uh, relations between the hydrogen and CO and the hydrogen CO and CO2 in order to avoid the deposition the uh, of uh, carbon on the catalyst, as well as uh, to optimize the, uh, the yield and the conversion of the reactor. Basically, uh, once we have the, the methanol, we, we use it uh, in the transesterification of the oil coming from the algae. And this step is really similar to the one we saw before, but in this particular case, what is changing is the surface of response model uh, used to predict the, con the conversion of the reaction as a, as a function of the new variable, because now we are using methanol instead of, uh, instead of ethanol. Again, we implement the, 
uh, simultaneous optimization and heat integration in order to control the pressures and temperatures of the different uh, units, especially the uh, distillation columns, so that we can uh, better integrate the energy involved in the, for instance, uh, cooler uh, the condenser and reboilers. So with this, you see, for instance, in this, uh, the, the amount of energy that can be uh, integrated and uh, the fact that uh, because of this integration, the uh, optimal operating conditions of the different reactors are not exactly the ones that are reported in the literature, basically because we are considered the entire process uh, to select the operating conditions and not only the ones that provide the largest uh, conversion at, the, at that particular reactor. So basically, of course, the production of this uh, kind of uh, biodiesel, uh, the advantage is that uh, we don't use any fossil based uh, raw material, but the investment in the biogas, because the, the residue is uh, highly diluted. So you have uh, just a little bit of bio of biomass of residue in water. So in the end, the, the volume of those reactors is quite high. So that's the reason why the investment cost goes 72% to the production of the biogas, 11% uh, to ethanol, and only 17% uh, uh, biodiesel. We consider a little bit the, the, the thing of scale up, as uh, our colleague presented uh, in the previous uh, talk. Basically, the fact that uh, uh, we need to target the production of these fuels that are somehow competitive. So, if we target one euro per gallon, basically, uh, because that was the target. Uh, how, uh, considering that the waste is manure from animals, what, uh, what is the, num the size of the farm that will provide the enough waste uh, for, for the facility, uh, taking advantage of this, uh, the economies of scale? So basically, we are targeting at uh, really large farms or just um, uh, the transportation of that uh, waste uh, if, uh, to a central facility so that the cost of the of this biodiesel is uh, is somehow competitive so that's one of the the issues but on the other hand we don't need to to buy any uh, fossil based methanol or ethanol with this kind of integration so in the end we can target the the, the design of the algae uh, in order to, for this facility is uh, to be to be integrated Another particular example is uh, if we go uh, and consider lignocellulosic biomass, it's also related to the previous talk. Uh, basically, um, lignocellulosic is, uh, contains cellulose, semicellulose, lignin, of course, a little bit of water and ash. Uh, in, by the time we started doing this, uh, the only experimental data uh, available to prove uh, the production of ibutene from biomass was from glucose so that's the way this uh, was integrated so uh, cellulose was the source from uh, glucose and any cellulose was the source from the uh, silos uh, and um, it is possible to produce ETB basically which is uh, an additive to, to fuels because the ETB is produced from ethanol and ibutene so instead of using ibutene again from uh, fossil fuels or fossil uh, resources the idea will be to be able to produce both simultaneously from biomass and be able to produce ETB from, uh, from, from them. Uh, this is a, a typical second generation biorefinery. You have to break down the biomass. We consider different pretreatments, uh, ammonia fiber explosion. In this particular case, instead of uh, using uh, gas ammonia, uh, we use a, a, a design from, from the developers of this uh, uh, pretreatment in which uh, the ammonia was absorbed in water so that you press you compress a liquid that uh, reduces the, the, the energy requirements for this process, but at the same time uh, avoids the problem with, uh, of working with uh, gas uh, ammonia. However, in the end, uh, the, the advantages in terms of money uh, were not competitive with dilute acid. The problem with dilute acid, as uh, many of you know, is the production of uh, uh, furans that are inhibitors for, for, for their operation. So in, the, in that case, is the, the trade-off that you have to consider. In terms of dilute acid, again, uh, all these reactors, the, the yield uh, from the uh, pretreatments are model using a surface of response model so that you can evaluate the operating conditions for the for the yield in the con in the context of the entire process. Once we have the the glucose, uh, sorry, the silos in this case, 
the silos is used for the uh, fermentation into ethanol. This uh, um, is actually you see here T2, T4, T T T basically, because we have a multi effect column there in order to reduce the energy consumption. And in this uh, section of the facility, we are producing ethanol. And in parallel, we, are, we were using uh, glucose in order to ferment it to uh, ibutene. Ibutene as a product is a gas that comes out with uh, CO2, and, and they have to be separated in order to, uh, to produce the ibutene. And the final product is uh, the final process or section of the process is the reactive distillation uh, column where uh, you, pro you use the methane, sorry, the ethanol and the ibutene in order to produce the IT, uh, ITV, ETV. Basically, we use uh, data from a rigorous simulation in Aspen in order to come up with this uh, surrogate uh, equation based model for, the, for, our, uh, for our system. So, if we use switchgrass as a raw material, we can produce 90, uh, 90 kilotons per year of ETBE from uh, a processing 560 kilotons per year of biomass. Basically, the cost is 0.61. However, this is for a fixed uh, composition, for a fixed raw, uh, biomass. So what if we allow the raw material uh, to be somehow a variable? So if we optimize the composition of the biomass for us to operate this facility, we come up with the solution that uh, this, the system of this uh, integrated facility targets 40% cellulose, 22% hemicellulose, and we can uh, increase the production uh, uh, rate by 16%. This means that we can select a biomass that will be able to operate this uh, facility better. The only, the, the only problem that I want to mention is that the pretreatments are highly sensitive to the type of biomass. So uh, we didn't have experimental data for each one of the biomass. So that's somehow the uncertainty in, 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 the, in the model, but uh, that could be uh, solved just by running more experiments with different biomasses and uh, uh, developing this, uh, those, uh, those knowledge. So now that we've uh, considered the fact of selecting different biomasses, we are going to target an, another example, which is the, pro the simultaneous production of silicon and sorbitol. I'm going to try to be brief, basically, because uh, this, uh, there are different uh, stages that uh, we've already been uh, com commenting on. For instance, the pretreatment, we again pre consider the same two pretreatments. And later, uh, we evaluated different uh, synthesis paths, fermentation and catalysis. And later, we have to evaporate and crystallize the silitol and sorbitol. Silitol comes from uh, silos. Uh, and sorbitol comes from uh, uh, glucose. So basically, uh, for it is possible to ferment the sugars to each one of the products, uh, and that's one of the alternatives we consider. We model each one of the uh, reactors using experimental data from the literature, and so. And the problem, for instance, when using uh, cellulose is that the fermentation works better from fructose. So we have to isomerize says the the cell the the glucose into uh, fructose for the for the fermentation to to run instead of using this uh, kind of biochemical uh, path we can use uh, high, uh, catalytic hydrogenation of the c5 and the six and and, and the c uh, c6 so basically that's uh, the second alternative and finally we have the multi effect evaporators in order to uh, purify and crystallize the, the two products. So the first stage would, uh, would be to select the, the, the process, so to select the different stages among the different pretreatments and the different synthesis paths. And for that, we use again uh, the switchgrass, and it came uh, by optimizing the, the superstructure. It came, out, it came down to the selection of dilute acid with uh, catalyst, uh, catalytic uh, hydrogenation. So we are going to be using this just to compare different biomasses. And uh, we use uh, sweet grass, corn stubborn, beards, uh, different um, uh, forest residues, hybrid popular, uh, sugar bagasse, and wheat straw. And the, the thing is, uh, we have two different things. One hand, on the one hand is the production cost, and another hand, on the other hand is the, the benefit. Why? Because the product, the, the market price for silitol is higher than sorbitol. So if you target 
uh, benefit, uh, the, the solution will be producing as much uh, xylitol as possible. Uh, if, and that's the, the table that you can see here, if you target lowest production cost, basically uh, is, the, is the one that selects corn stover here. As, as you see, for instance, the, the production cost is uh, 16.3 million euros uh, per year to process around 20 kilos per second of, of, uh, of biomass. So uh, the, the second thing, uh, apart from the comparison, and this uh, is uh, just for that uh, better profit, which is the composition of the biomass and which is the biomass that will be uh, the closest. So uh, again, we free the variable of the composition of the biomass and it came out, uh, the solution was uh, suggested was 40% hemicellulose, 20% 20, uh, 20 cellulose, which is the raw material, which is the closest, uh, sargassum algae. So the idea of the profit, uh, the profit, as I mentioned before, is because of the larger production of xylitol uh, and its higher uh, market price. Uh, as you can see from the production cost, it's a little uh, lower than uh, switchgrass, but uh, more expensive than using corn stover. The problem is that in, in case of using corn stover, both silitol and sorbitol are more or less similar uh, in terms of uh, production capacity in this facility, while in the case of uh, sargassum algae, uh, basically uh, because of the, the market price, uh, it allows a production of silitol that is higher. So we are going to change a little bit uh, the gears and, uh, and we are going to be focusing on the developing of a circular economy that involves the uh, bio refineries in order to process the waste, but at the same time being able to run a farm. So basically what, what we want to do here is we're going to evaluate uh, what are the uh, different biomasses that are going to be used to grow uh, cows for, for meat. However, we are going to process that waste, record the nutrients, and use those nutrients in order to grow again the, the crops. So for this kind of uh, model, we are going to consider two, two phases. The first is, is only the, the operation of, of this farm, and later we go for the uh, allocation. So uh, this kind of uh, problem uh, involves we, uh, the modeling of the energy needs of the cattle, the crop management. So we are going to consider seven forage and five concentrated uh, raw materials. We are going to uh, treat that waste. So basically it's, uh, the waste treatment is the anaerobic digestion followed by the recovery of nutrients, uh, nitrogen and phosphorus, uh, especially in order to be able to uh, reduce the fertilizer need for the growth of this uh, biomass. That is a large NLP. And we are going to consider uh, multi-objective because uh, it's important to consider price and environmental index and multi-period because as the, mm, the cattle uh, produces on, uh, as the cattle grows, as we have uh, a small yearlings and they grow to become uh, full size animals, the uh, crop needed changes because of the, the energy required by these uh, uh, animals. So, basically, in terms of economic assessment, basically, is uh, the cost involved in uh, the crops, uh, growing the crops, uh, harvesting, and so on, the fertilizer, auxiliaries. Uh, and also we can have some income from the, the excess of crops. So basically the crop that you are not going to use to, to feed the animals can be sold. Uh, the potential income de derived from the presence of animals that at the, uh, at the end, mm, they, they will be uh, sold, the meat that is going to be produced. And also uh, we can get something from the biogas uh, when we are processing the, the manure. So uh, for this, First case, we are going to consider uh, the lifetime of a, of a cow, basically uh, with three gestations, so that we, uh, in each gestation, it generates three, uh, three little uh, animals, and then, uh, then uh, as they grow, they will affect the composition of the, of the uh, feed, basically, 
the economic scenario and the multi objective scenario are presented uh, next. So basically, the, the thing is, as the animal, uh, the, the small animals require more energy, that's the reason why uh, in the first stages uh, we are going to be using more grain. As they grow, the, they not, don't need that much uh, energy, and that's why the composition of the feed changes into uh, forage, basically start, uh, straw, with the straw, barley straw, and so on. And if we compare the economic scenario to the multi-objective scenario, the, the idea is, on the one hand, try to reduce the, the area used, and on the other hand, try to, use, try to reduce the fertilizer. In some cases, both come at the same time. So for instance, uh, while in the second stage, you are uh, by uh, optimizing, considering the, the environmental impact, uh, we reduce the cultivation area and that comes with a reduced uh, decrease in the use of uh, fertilizer. Uh, in, the in the next stage, we basically have a large area again, but uh, we again uh, reduce the fertilizer. So that's the reason why uh, this multi scenario works basically by integrating the use of uh, the, the selecting first the type of raw material that is going to be used as feed and processing the, the manure generated by the, uh, the cows in order to reduce as much as possible the fertilizer needed for the for the growth uh, for the growth of the crops. So just to the last example is uh, okay. We have the facility, we have the farm, but where we are going to locate that farm? So we use uh, as an example uh, the entire uh, Spanish uh, uh, mainland. So basically, and this is a particular problem we are. Uh, it's on the news. It has been on the news lately. They are, uh, we have uh, followed a three step uh, procedure. The first is a pre screening stage. There are some uh, allocations where the actual or the, mm, the concentration of nutrients already available uh, somehow prevents or uh, suggests not to allocate the facilities there. So, in this pre screening, uh, uh, we uh, uh, remove from the analysis 145 districts out of 345. And later we have an economic approach to evaluate which is the size, which is the number of initial animals that will be involved in our facility. And the last uh, stage is just the selection of the location and the operation of such for a lifetime of 25 years, if I remember uh, correctly. So uh, this, uh, actually, uh, the the final solution is Bureva Ebro. So basically, some, uh, it's something somewhere around here. It's uh, uh, selecting one uh, one thousand two hundred animals, and uh, the idea is that it is possible to reduce the environmental impact by 56 percent. Uh, and uh, through a reduction of fertilizer consumption, basically because of the good use of the biomass that can be grown in that particular area, the processes of the waste in order to recover the nutrients and the use of those nutrients as fertilizer in order to avoid uh, mineral fertilizers. So with this, uh, just uh, to conclude, we've been uh, the, uh, using mathematical optimization methods in order to develop and help develop a circular economy. Uh, for process and product design. We've considered the product design in terms of uh, giving um, guidelines to select the biomass that will allow us to operate our facilities at the, at the highest. And also uh, the second problem will be the selection of different ingredients in order to be able to operate our, our farms <clears throat> and the integration and the recovery of the nutrients uh, for this uh, circular economy. Uh, I'd like also to thank all the, the funding uh, from the Spanish government, from the European Project for Bio, as well as from the regional government, Punta Castilla Leon, and all the people that have made this uh, possible, uh, my group here at the University of Salamanca. And uh, thank you, every one of you, from, uh, for giving me the opportunity to present our work uh, in this audience. Thanks a lot, and we're happy to, to take any questions that you may have.
Okay, thank you very much, Professor Mariano Martin, for your presentation. Very interesting. Uh, I don't see questions uh, in the chat. Have one for you. <laughs> okay, uh, how did you simulate the performance of the uh, anaerobic digester? Uh, we have mass and energy balances for all the ingredients and we have experimental data for the yield of the different uh, residues. So basically, if you have a manure, we have experimental data for the amount of biogas that is produced uh, per kilo of, uh, of waste, as well as the composition of the gas in terms of uh, fraction, the CO, methane, and so on. So basically, it's an equation-based model using experimental data for the yield and the composition of the gas. Mm -hmm. and also for the uh, digestive. Okay. Have you also considered some uh, optimization uh, with by using co-digestion or biomasses? The, the problem with the co-digestion, I mean, we, we've considered that. The thing is, uh, sometimes you don't have the experimental data to see how the different biomasses uh, interact with each other. Sometimes there is some inhibition, and if you don't have the, the data or the models to capture that inhibition, maybe your results are not uh, the, the mass and energy balances results don't match the experimental da data. Uh, some, in some cases, we have experimental data to give us that information related to those inhibition or the, uh, of how the condensation works. If not, we prefer just to use separately the, the residues, just to avoid um, results that are not. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Julian. Thanks a lot, everyone. So no more questions. We can pass to the next presentation that is from Professor Bernard Peters and is titled Challenging of the XDM Simulation Platform for Large-Scale Biomass Furnaces. Yes, good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, you hear me? Yes. Okay, perfect. Yes, then, uh, yes, thank you very much for the introduction. And um, as already mentioned, uh, I want to basically present, uh, yes, an uh, approach, an, a simulation approach uh, for, uh, yes, sim uh, for predicting the performance uh, and operation of uh, large, large scale biomass furnaces or building industrial, industrial biomass furnaces, as is shown here on the left hand side uh, for an. Uh, Great fire. Uh, screen, uh, I think. Ah, okay. Sorry, yes. Yes, I'm sorry, I forgot that. <laughs> Share screen. You should see it now. Yes. Okay, perfect. Yes, thank you for reminding me. I forgot to that. Yes, okay. There is building, as I mentioned already, here on the left hand side, you see the big uh, industrial scale uh, biomass furnace, a great fired furnace that, uh, yes, um, is yes, an industrial scale uh, furnace and uh, of appropriate uh, size, then. And basically, I have uh, structured my uh, talk into an introduction. Then I will be in which I basically define the setup and the uh, physics and the processes. And then I will uh, look into a uh, particle resolution uh, properties, furnace analysis, and I will uh, finish my uh, talk with a summary. So basically, the uh, purpose of the modeling approach is to represent the entire biomass furnace <coughs> and its processes. Uh, with its uh, complex interactions. And that is basically done with the extended discrete element method. That is uh, essentially a coupling between a discrete approach and a continuous approach uh, for uh, such a furnace. And obviously the uh, discrete approach is uh, dealing with the particles. And here we have to uh, deal or have to address basically the uh, motion of the particles uh, through the furnace on the uh, forward acting grade or the vibrating grade, depending on the uh, setup of the furnace. And then uh, that's one part of the uh, particles. And the second uh, part of the particles is the thermodynamics of the particles that uh, we have to address in this uh, approach because these uh, particles undergo uh, 
a sequence or a variety of processes uh, that generate products and uh, these uh, processes are uh, very much dependent on the interaction between the uh, gas so the primary air or secondary air and the particles and that is basically uh, the challenge here to deal with uh, such a number of uh, partners such a big number of particles and the uh, size of the entire furnace in terms of predicting the uh, flow uh, features and uh, flow features temperature and the composition of the gas phase uh, on one hand inside the, or inside the packed bed so basically uh, where the packed bed is moving and secondly as well in the freeboard region it means basically the larger part of the furnace above the packed bed <clears throat> and that, of course, uh, when that is done or when that is feasible, then we can analyze operation condition, for example, primary air, second, uh, or primary air, secondary air distributions. And um, that is something that is an anticipated uh, or is running at the moment. It is very then, of course, with these deals and information that you uh, gain from uh, such a uh, biomass furnace or in general from any kind of uh, reactor that uh, operates with a uh, pack of moving beds, uh, you can uh, use this data for the development of the artificial in in intelligence in order to apply then model predictive control, what is then the uh, ultimate goal uh, for uh, such a furnace to basically uh, develop uh, control uh, tools that control operation of the furnace, depending on, for example, the incoming uh, fuel, the humidity of the fuel, and uh, so far. So basically, this is the purpose of the modeling approach. And uh, yes, as I already mentioned here, that is uh, an image of the uh, furnace. And the, you basically see, if you look at the dimensions, uh, the length of the furnace is almost is, uh, 11 and a half meters, the height 12 meters, and the width of the furnace, so the width of the crater as well is uh, four meters. And um, basically some, yes, uh, basic and primary operation conditions. We have a, flu, uh, a fuel airflow rate of uh, 12,000 uh, uh, kilograms per second, so 12 ton, uh, tons per, uh, per uh, no, sorry, that is not kilogram per second, that is uh, kilogram per hour, that is uh, 12 tons per hour. And uh, yes, the fuel, uh, fuel and air temperature, uh, ambient temperature 293, 300 Kelvin. Then uh, the uh, primary airflow is uh, 33,000 cubic meters per hour, and the secondary airflow is uh, 13 uh, cubic meters per hour. And the furnace is operated with an uh, Air, an excess air ratio of approximately uh, 40%. And uh, the what you see here basically at the, uh, what I wanted to say here, at this side are these uh, secondary air nozzles where we have about 119 uh, secondary air nozzles to basically increase the uh, mixing of the uh, products of the uh, packed bed uh, with uh, secondary air and uh, uh, aiming at a uh, complete uh, combustion of these uh, products for heat generation. Then, uh, as already mentioned, uh, the great processes that uh, we have to address is the uh, transport of the biomass, then uh, the uh, supply of primary air, basically having a strong interaction with the packed bed and uh, particles or biomass pellets uh, that are entering the furnace undergo a variety of processes. The first of this process, of course, heating up uh, of these particles. And during the heat up phase, we have the drying of these particles that uh, yields then uh, vapor. And this vapor is transferred into uh, the gas phase and transported into the freeboard of the furnace. Then after, uh, or sometimes as well simultaneously with the uh, drying uh, phase, uh, the uh, pyrolysis, pyrolysis phase already uh, commences and uh, the pyrolysis phase uh, is basically the decomposition of uh, biomass into a number of uh, gaseous products and uh, coke. And uh, we basically approximate the uh, pyrolysis uh, with uh, the, pro uh, the pyrolysis yielding them as products, methane, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, hydrogen, tar and coke and whereby methane, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide and hydrogen and tar are gaseous products that are transferred into the gas phase for further uh, combustion. 
and coke obviously is the uh, solid uh, product uh, from the uh, pyrolysis of the uh, virgin biomass and uh, this coke is going to be gasified uh, with the uh, primary air and uh, yielding uh, carbon monoxide that again is transferred into the freeboard of the furnace and they are reacting with oxygen of the uh, secondary air or mainly of the secondary air to form the carbon, uh, carbon dioxide. And as I already mentioned, yes, the freeboard processes, these are basically all the processes that are happening above the, pack, above the pack bed or the moving bed in, a, in such a furnace is the mixing of the gaseous products with secondary air in order to hopefully, yes, or what is aimed is a complete combustion of these uh, gaseous products and for that, of course, uh, not only for that, but as well for uh, em uh, reduced emissions, you need uh, sufficient residence time of these uh, products uh, within the uh, furnace in order to uh, uh, guarantee a complete combustion uh, to the uh, final products of uh, combustion, namely vapor and uh, carbon dioxide. And uh, essentially, yes, um, just giving you an image of the on, uh, image of the uh, furnace. That's uh, what you see here. That's the complete uh, CFD mesh of the furnace. And you see basically here these uh, yes dark blue areas here on the uh, side of the furnace over the bits of the furnace uh, is the mesh refinement uh, for uh, representing the uh, secondary air nozzles that you're going to see here on the, yes, the close up on uh, the, uh, this uh, figure here. You may essentially see here the, uh, yes, the uh, nozzles, these uh, circular nozzles. And as I already mentioned, we have about uh, 119 of these uh, nozzles uh, distributed at the various location on both, side of the, uh, both sides of the furnace. So here really on this side, we have about uh, four rows. And on the other side, we have about, yes, we have five rows of these secondary air nozzles. And these are then basically essentially as shown here, uh, distributed over the uh, widths of the furnace. And uh, through these nozzles, we injecting then the uh, secondary air that uh, is then uh, enhancing uh, the mixing features of the uh, furnace, uh, plus providing uh, sufficient uh, oxygen for uh, further combustion of the uh, products that uh, products that have been formed during the pyrolysis of the uh, biomass. And uh, essentially here, look into the uh, furnace. We have here basically, this is a furnace with uh, two different uh, crate uh, techniques. We have here at the entrance region from which the uh, biomass is fed into the furnace, we have a forward acting crate, meaning this is kind of, as you see here, staircase, like uh, construction and uh, basically here every second grade is moving forward and backward and the uh, crates uh, between the uh, moving crates are uh, stationary so that these forward and backward, move, backward moving crates uh, transporting the uh, biomass uh, pellets uh, through the furnace uh, over the crate here and then essentially at the end of the crate they fall into uh, this kind of what is here represented as a box but essentially this is a vibrating crate that then uh, basically uh, is uh, or takes over the uh, biomass falling off from the last crate of the forward acting crate and then basically uh, yes due to the uh, vibration and as well through to the inclination Gravity uh, is then moving the um, <clears throat> biomass pellets uh, over the forward, uh, over the uh, vibrating crate to the end to the end region where we have the ash pit where all the combustion should be completed, and essentially then ash particles fall into the ash pit. And the here the next uh, image uh, shows the uh, crate, both crates with uh, uh, loaded with uh, particles here at the. Uh, entrance the forward acting crate with an, a, a somewhat higher, a higher inclination than the uh, vibrating crate so really essentially particles are introduced here over the length of the over, over the, not length over the bits of the grid of the crate and then transported through these uh, forward uh, forward moving uh, crates uh, through the uh, uh, over the over the crate into the uh, vi uh, vibrating crate region and then, of course, uh, further transport uh, takes place up to the end of the vibrating crate, where we then have the ash pit. So this is basically the uh, <clears throat> the uh, main features of the furnace with <clears throat> the uh, 
with its uh, geometry of the yes the uh, gas uh, or the uh, freeboard plus the uh, crate uh, the forward acting crate and the vibrating crate and essentially uh, if i go back to this one here what uh, we doing in uh, this uh, simulation setup we describe we describe obviously from the bottom here we have the primary air uh, supply and i already mentioned the secondary air supply to through the nozzles and essentially what we do basically when the primary air streams through the uh, moving bed here over on the uh, vibrating crate and the uh, forward acting crate we describe the uh, in uh, on the one hand the motion of each particle through the furnace and second and secondary the um, thermodynamic state of the particle in terms uh, meaning basically particles are entering here from the beginning uh, first uh, undergo a heat up phase then the drying phase and then uh, essentially yes the for uh, this region here the forward acting crate is you know, more or less reserved for the uh, drying phase of the uh, of the uh, biomass meaning that at the end of the uh, forward acting crate, we have dry biomass entering the uh, vibrating crate. And we see as well that uh, some of the particles have already started uh, to pyrolyze uh, and the pyrolyzation is uh, taking a, a further place here on the uh, vibrating crate in this region uh, and then later on gasification at the last, uh, at the last uh, uh, region of the uh, vibrating crate. And as I say, we describe the uh, thermodynamic uh, state of each particle that means in terms of uh, temperature distribution inside the particle, plus then, of course, the uh, trying uh, process, pyrolysis process and gasification. And I have shown uh, or will show here on the next slide exemplar uh, as an example, the for one particle that I've picked out of the uh, packed bed, the uh, trying phase basically here, that is uh, here basically we have here the time for just the trying phase of the particle and here basically the uh, dimension the radial dimension of the particle and the uh, z uh, coordinate uh, describes the uh, temperature distribution inside the particle and you basically see essentially starting the particle starts with uh, or enters uh, with a temperature of about uh, 300 kelvin then, of course, uh, we have at the first stage, we have a uh, heat up process of the particle due to uh, heat transfer from uh, the walls to radiative heat transfer. And that means maybe at some stage, uh, the particle reaches the evaporation temperature. And then uh, once the particle has reached evaporation temperature, then uh, all the heat that is uh, <clears throat> transferred to the particle is going to be used or to uh, basically uh, evaporate or dry the particle, meaning that the uh, water inside the particle, the humidity inside the particle undergoes a phase change from liquid uh, to gas, meaning we forming vapor at, uh, yes, inside the particle. And uh, this vapor is then transported through the pore space to the uh, surface of the particle, is then transferred into the uh, gas phase, to this, into the uh, CFD phase. And then obviously we having a traditional CFD processes taking place, uh, the transport and the uh, distribution of the vapor inside the furnace. And that of course means as long as we evaporating uh, uh, humidity or water inside the particle, the temperature stays constant, which, which you see here, this plateau-like uh, region where we have the temperature at the evaporation temperature inside the particle. And we see here clearly that uh, basically uh, the drying process as uh, to be anticipated starts from the outside the surface of the particle and, and propagates into the inside uh, to the center of the particle. That means we see a dry region at, the at first at the uh, outside of the particle. And that means here the temperature can slow, uh, slowly increase again, whereas in the interior of the particle, we still have uh, water that evaporates and the temperature is there constant. And only once the, uh, the particle, particle is completely dry, then uh, we see again the temperature range of uh, temperature raise inside the particle, meaning the temperature is increasing according to the heat transfer conditions and of course of the motion of the particles. And that is an important feature because uh, we have, on the, especially in the forward acting crate, a mixing of the particles. So the particle is uh, mixed with other particles and means uh, that it is uh, 
sometimes inside the packed bait, sometimes on the uh, surface at the top of the packed bait where it receives then radiated flux from the uh, walls. And thus the uh, heat is, uh, what I want to say, the heat is increasing again. And here basically the, uh, what I wanted to say, the uh, water distribution in the particle. So we starting this particle had an uh, initial water uh, level or humidity of 33%. And we see basically here that the drying process starts as well from the uh, outer side, the outside of the particle, propagating into the particle until we have at least uh, at some stage in a completely dry particle. And this particle is then going uh, or has already started or is undergoing at the latest at this stage uh, pyrolysis as well, dependent on uh, the temperature <coughs> evolution and distribution inside the particle. So that means basically uh, the drying process, of course, obviously the drying process, as I already mentioned, uh, produces an, uh, a vapor that is transferred into the uh, gas phase, so the free board above the pack bail. And that's what you basically see. I have here basically a cut uh, through the uh, center section of the uh, furnace, where we have then basically, of course, as already mentioned, and to be anticipated here at the on the forward acting crate, the uh, main drying uh, region. So we have barely half, approximately half of the forward acting crate is the uh, heat up region of the particles. And then once the particle temperature has uh, reached evaporation temperature, then we produce here the uh, water. And that's what we're going to see as well here on the uh, on these two scales. The right scale uh, uh, defines or represents the water, the humidity or the integral humidity inside the particle and uh, the uh, scale here on the left hand side is the uh, scale for water so the water mass fraction inside the furnace and we see it basically here at the beginning that we having here a strong uh, production from our formation of vapor due to the drying process and uh, somehow a reduced uh, evaporation process here at the uh, beginning and the entrance or the start of the uh, forward acting crate and we see basically that here the particles at the surface of the or particle at the surface of the crate is completely dry. Whereas, of course, obviously the particles inside the pet bay that are shielded by the uh, top particles uh, from radiation uh, still have a significant amount of uh, what I want to say water humidity inside the particle. And that, of course, extends almost to the end of the crate. And only because then basically here, we have uh, due to pyrolysis and uh, gasification particle uh, becoming smaller as uh, they are shrinking and therefore of course as well here the fact bait is as well uh, decreasing in height meaning that here basically the particle still sets uh, see them basically then uh, yeah, increased heat transfer and can uh, uh, try. That's basically the uh, trying uh, region or the trying process inside the biomass furnace. Then basically here the flow field uh, represented yes by the uh, gas velocity and the uh, biomass velocity. Obviously the biomass velocity is uh, very much smaller than the uh, gas velocity. So we have here basically yes, um, let's first focus on the uh, gas velocity. So the uh, we see here clearly on uh, the uh, sides here and on both sides of the furnace the uh, uh, injection of uh, secondary air that of course has a strong uh, effect or is influencing the uh, what I wanted to say the uh, flow field to a large extent because here we injecting air with about I think if I don't mistake about 90 meter per second whereas the uh, air that is entering here at the bottom as primary air as, uh, as primary air has uh, velocities of uh, yes, 0.2, uh, 0.3, uh, 0.4 meters per second. So uh, basically very much uh, lower than the secondary air injection. And therefore, of course, the secondary air injection is has a strong impact on the entire flow feed inside the furnace. And here we're having here the region at this uh, orifice uh, with the highest velocity. And uh, due to the expansion here, we see here as well some recirculating region uh, uh, due to the uh, sudden, or um, not sudden, but uh, rather a strong expansion of the uh, upper part of the furnace onto, uh, until uh, into the uh, boiler. 
And of course, here the biomass basically we see here basically biomass yes, here as uh, here as well. This to do from we have barely here in the center somehow an uh, region of particles that is um, undergoes or has very low uh, velocities uh, due to the effect that of course the uh, friction between the particles and of course um, the uh, shape of the particles is uh, uh, basically uh, restricting the uh, motion of the biomass on the uh, forward acting crate and the vibrating crate. Then basically, yes, here an uh, image of the uh, temperature field, essentially both the temperature for the uh, particles and the uh, gas temperature. And we see here basically as yes, obviously that uh, particles that are on top of the uh, pack bed, they uh, see or receive radiation from the uh, hot walls and uh, therefore are heated up and undergoing the, uh, yes, the processes of pyrolysis and gasification. And all, of course, the particles below this top layer of particles, they see almost don't see any radiation. Um, and therefore, they only have uh, uh, experiencing heat transfer uh, through the uh, primary air that is as well, more or less the um, yes ambient temperature like the particles. So there is not much heat transfer from the primary air. And the only remaining heat transfer me mechanism for uh, the pack B tier is the uh, conduction between particles in contact. That means basically the hot particles on the uh, top of the uh, moving bed are transferring heat into the pack B just by uh, pure uh, conduction. And it depends basically on the contact uh, between the particles due to the motion of the furnace. And obviously, since uh, this is, uh, yes, the contact area between the particles is rather small and, uh, of course, as well, only taking place for, uh, for a limited time, then, of course, the heat transfer through conduction into the back bed is uh, rather limited as compared uh, for the uh, top layer particles or the particles on top of the uh, back bed uh, through radiation. So, in essentially, as we see basically here, that um, we have here see obviously these hot particles transfer heat to the primary air so the primary air is heated by the hot particles and then of course here from uh, the sides we have the uh, injection of uh, primary air and that's what we're going to see in one of the next slides and the mixture with the uh, pyrolysis products and that of course um, is then uh, burning <coughs> burning these pyrolysis products with secondary air and leading them to an uh, temperature increase uh, from uh, inside uh, the furnace. And we see here as well clearly that we're having as well here, that we see later here, and uh, yes, on this, on the right hand side, the highest temperature that is basically from, yes, once uh, the, com uh, on one side from the combustion of the uh, pyrolysis products, but as well the uh, combustion of uh, carbon monoxide that is coming from the uh, last region, uh, from the gasification region of the uh, vibrating crate. And here, basically, the oxygen field and the biomass uh, char, basically, you see here, Billy, that uh, we have here, obviously, yes, uh, oxygen uh, introduced from, uh, uh, from the prima, uh, from primary and as well from the secondary air. And we have an obviously, here in the center region uh, of uh, reduced oxygen concentration due to the oxidation due to the oxidation of these uh, gaseous products that burn inside the furnace and then uh, basically uh, leading to this kind of streak like uh, reduced uh, oxygen concentration inside the furnace here and the same thing for the uh, char so basically char is produced uh, during the pyrolysis and that's basically you see here that uh, we have here Yes, uh, production uh, furnace. So again, the particles on the uh, top of the uh, moving bed are the ones uh, undergoing the uh, processes and uh, basically in this form, uh, forming then uh, char that is then basically oxidized uh, with the oxygen that is uh, delivered by the primary air uh, through the uh, back bed. Then uh, basically the tar field, one of the uh, products uh, of uh, what I wanted to say, uh, the uh, products of the pyrolysis process, obviously, yes, we have here the forward acting crate is mainly uh, reserved for the drying process, but we see here as well that at the end of the uh, 
what I wanted to say this uh, forward acting crate, we have already some pyrolysis starting that produces then the basically the uh, tar. And that is what we're going to see here as well in the uh, main region here of the vibrating crate. We have here a region where we have uh, a strong production of uh, pyrolysis and the formation of tar. And that, of course, is here basically then uh, mixed with the uh, secondary air from both sides and then uh, burnt to uh, form then essentially uh, basically uh, carbon, monox uh, carbon dioxide and uh, vapor. And we see basically that, um, yes, here we here still have at the entrance or at the end of the freeboard region or in the entrance of the boiler still some uh, amount of uh, tar that has not uh, managed to be uh, burned uh, com completely uh, within the uh, or within the furnace. So meaning the residence time is somehow too short to get uh, this uh, uh, all the tar amount uh, burned. Then here the uh, basically the uh, carbon monoxide field here that's very here again that is here you see very here strong uh, two strong regions that's one here in the pyrolysis area of this of the great region of the great where we produce carbon monoxide and then here at the end of the uh, uh, or at the end of the great at the uh, gasification region where basically the uh, produ uh, the coke uh, produced uh, during pyrolysis is uh, gasified to boost produce carbon monoxide and that is then again as well oxidized with the uh, secondary air to uh, carbon dioxide. And here we see as well that uh, we still have basically here uh, a streak of uh, carbon monoxide uh, entering or leaving the uh, entering the uh, boiler region of the uh, furnace. So we see as well incomplete combustion of the uh, carbon monoxide. And then here the carbon, obviously the carbon dioxide field is uh, essentially an uh, consequence of the uh, combustion process of uh, the uh, product of pyrolysis, uh, methane, hydrogen, uh, carbon monoxide, as well from the gasification. And this, uh, yes, basically, uh, yes, shown here, basically, again, here, a streak of uh, carbon monoxide uh, going through the uh, uh, freeboard region of the uh, furnace. Then uh, what, of course, this is fairly, yes, rather detailed uh, results uh, coming from the analysis of the flow fields and the uh, particle processes in the furnace. But what is as well very important, uh, uh, since we having all the, uh, <clears throat> what I wanted to say, uh, the describe the thermodynamic state of each particle and the uh, gas phase at each time, we can, of course, apply then uh, statistical uh, tools in order to, for example, to describe here versus the great lengths, uh, the distribution of organic matter, basically the biomass, water, ash and char. And that is really some one of the, uh, what I wanted to say, uh, outcomes uh, that uh, we can uh, do with the uh, with statistical tools to describe here the distribution. And we see here basically, yes, water, of course, obviously is going down. So then, and then char is increasing here <coughs> in the char uh, in the pyrolysis region, and then as well reduced again uh, due to the uh, gasification process. And similarly, of course, again in matter the biomass is reduced as well continuously over the uh, length of the crate. And uh, basically, essentially here, what we see is an animation of the light up phase of the furnace. Barely you see here, barely from left side the particles introduced over the grate and entering the uh, what i want to say the vibrating grate and then as well here the uh, temperature evolution and you see as well here uh, the uh, low frequency fluctuations uh, that you basically see as well when you uh, uh, observe the uh, fire and the uh, uh, combustion process in such a furnace <coughs> due to the once the motion of the uh, particles on the grate that always uh, 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 is for the uh, incoming primary air uh, uh, in time varying uh, resistance, flow resistance, and thus leading to these uh, low frequency uh, not under the stay, uh, fluctuations inside the uh, flow field and of course the temperature and uh, species distribution. Essentially, yes, that brings me to the uh, summary that uh, <clears throat> with the approach here, the coupling of CFD, uh, CFD with uh, discrete element method or the extended discrete element method, we can 
basically describe the transport of the biomass on a forward acting and vibrating grade. Then the decomposition, so the thermodynamics of this biomass in the uh, and the freeport uh, region, which is then basically uh, then uh, predicting, uh, giving us the uh, temperature and uh, species or the gas composition and species distribution. Then uh, basically we can uh, observe the evolution of biomass process along the grades and uh, <coughs> we can uh, see that basically the production of prior, prying pyrolysis gasification product and this transport and transfer. And that's of course in the end uh, leads to the overall performance of a biomass furnace depending on charging particle size, some physical properties like the humidity and operation conditions, for example, the distribution between secondary and primary air. And essentially that enables us to more efficient and sustainable utilization of the renewable of renewable energy resources. And that brings me to the end of my presentation. So thank you very much for your attention. And I'm happy to answer uh, any questions that you may have. Okay, thank you very much, Professor Peters for your presentation. There are two questions in the yeah. chat. Have you tried the, your model to simulate, for example, incinerators with the moving rate that use municipal solid waste? Um, we are at the moment in the process of applying this <coughs> to uh, municipal solid waste. The difficulty that we see here is basically compared to uh, pellets or biomass, the waste <coughs> or the properties of the waste are much uh, to la much larger to, uh, uh, degree uh, undefined or difficult to determine. Uh, basically, it's yes, as usual material properties to define the waste material in an appropriate way that is uh, representative uh, for the actual waste material. Okay. What is the largest possible biomass particle size that can be modeled? We basically don't have any restrictions of biomass uh, particles. I mean, yeah, of course, I mean, as I say, uh, we have basically, um, yes, a one dimensional representation of the inner particle processes. So essentially, if we're looking at uh, pellets and things like that, uh, so centimeter size particles, no problem. Um, if we're looking, I guess the question is aiming at uh, log fires where we have then uh, big uh, wood blocks. And of course there uh, you have basically a three dimensional <coughs> uh, distribution of temperature and things like inside the uh, <coughs> log wood pieces. So that uh, the, um, yes, the uh, representation with a one dimensional approach along the radius for such perhaps cylindrical kind of uh, wood pieces is um, yes, questionable. Okay. What, the method we don't have any restrictions from the for the particle size. What would be the optimal conditions of biomass particles in terms of water content? In terms of water content, I mean the humidity. Of course, I mean the optimal conditions would be basically that you enter the furnace with uh, dry particles because then you can save. Uh, a lot of invest uh, in terms of uh, the furnace is shorter, but of course that is not feasible. We usually have particles or yes, uh, particles coming in with uh, humidity between <coughs> 20 and four, <coughs> 20 and 40 percent. And then of course, yes, uh, there is no optimal condition. The thing is basically you have to make sure that uh, the drying phase is complete and as fast as possible. That means usually that you have to do, have to take care of a good mixture on the uh, on the uh, moving bed, so that basically um, yes, all the particles receive basically a sufficient amount of energy for uh, what I wanted to say for the drying process. Okay, thank you very much. There are no more questions. Thank you okay. for your presentation and uh, the. Last presentation will be from Nicholas Vollmer and uh, is titled Uncertainty in the Techno-Economic and Sustainability Assessment of Biorefineries. Yes, hello, good morning, everybody. I will quickly share my screen. 
Um, I hope the presentation is visible now. Yes, I see your presentation. Perfect. Okay, yes, as I said, good morning um, from uh, Wuppertal, Germany, from my side. Um, thank you very much um, for the invitation um, and also for uh, hosting the session, Julia and Martin. Um, I will just dive uh, directly into the topic, I would say. So, um, yeah, my name is Nicholas. I'm a former PhD student at the Process and Systems Engineering Research Center at the Technical University of Denmark under the supervision of Kurt Kansin, uh, my professor there. And um, yeah, without further ado, um, just a brief uh, introduction maybe to this topic. I don't know if some of you uh, remember this picture uh, or not. It was taken in 1972 by uh, William Schmidt on the Apollo 17 mission is one of the few um, man-made pictures uh, of Earth from outer space. And um, this actually coincides uh, with the publication of the um, report, The Limits uh, to Growth by the Club of Rome in um, 1972 as well, where um, as a first of its kind report, um, a wider audience um, publicly was um, basically pointed um, towards uh, more attention of topics as uh, sustainable um, living, sustainable production patterns, etc. And um, since then, on a global level, just to give a few examples, in 1992, the United Nations um, ratified the Framework Convention on uh, Combating Climate Change, followed by the Kyoto Protocol in 1997 and in 2016, the Paris Agreement to limit the um, global warming due to greenhouse gas emissions to a maximum of two degrees, favorably 1.5 degrees um, in global average. Um, compared to pre-industrial times. But if you look at the numbers on the other side in 1972, we talk about 0.26 degrees Celsius already um, increased global average temperature. In 1992, for example, 0.48, 1997, 0.78. And in 2016, the highest um, basically recorded temperature in uh, this time frame, 1.29 degrees Celsius. So we don't have too much, um, let's say, buffer zone left until we hit the, the bar. And um, what we need to do while we're all here um, is to rethink the way we um, we especially let's say consume and produce in terms of how we how we can live more sustainably. Um, so this talk in particular will target, um, as said, um, the assessment of um, second generation biorefineries in, uh, in terms of uncertainty. Um, but if we look at um, a report of McKinsey in um, this regard on the future of second generation biomass, they identify seven let's say, problem areas where um, we still as, um, let's say, industry or as, as, um, yeah, as also researchers maybe um, fail to um, basically properly target these issues in order to promote a widespread industrialization of these second generation biomass refineries. Um, in terms of resources, the biggest problem here is um, reliable technology in terms of novel unit operations which are needed for example for um, the utilization of second generation biomass um, i will get to that in a second uh, i've looked into that in the scope of my phd um, and then secondly feedstock access if we think about the the terrible war which is ongoing in the ukraine at the moment if for example you utilize wheat straw as second generation biomass and um, basically your main supplier is not able to deliver anymore this uh, gets you into trouble if you run such a biorefinery Thirdly, um, more from a capital, capital um, point of view, this is a high risk venture. There are not a lot of biorefineries currently operating in uh, industry at commercial level, producing other things than bioethanol. Uh, we'll also get that in a second. So uh, let's say any um, novel project here is not able to rely on a lot of experience uh, with our, uh, within industry. So um, there's a lot of risk associated to the investment here. Then on a management level, um, what could be better is definitely, um, they call it here industrialization capabilities. What is meant by that is um, especially collaboration, not only between academia and industry, but also between more, let's say, small scale startups with have, which have experience in, um, for example, developing novel strains for, um, for the fermentative production of a novel product. Um, together with bigger industrial um, partners who are able to um, industrialize um, to scale up such processes. Um, also necessary here value chain integrations. So for example, 
standalone biorefinery will be always more difficult to implement than basically a, a plug-in biorefinery if you want um, to an existing um, process, for example, a pulp and paper mill where you have side streams which you could utilize on the other hand. And then market, um, let's say limitations lacking demand. If we think about um, the, um, let's say the main product which is produced right now by second generation um, biorefineries, which is bioethanol, the question is, if we look at um, EU policies, for example, on um, the future of mobility, if more and more people drive with electric cars, the question is, do we in 10, 20 years need that much bioethanol as fuels for our cars? This is important to consider now if you make such an investment. And uh, lastly, also, from a political point of view, the unsupportive regulation, which um, one can face in terms of um, yeah, basically yeah, support by, by funding or other um, frameworks, this is definitely also something to be addressed. So um, throughout this uh, little presentation, I will guide you through a case study, which I've investigated on um, entitled Xalito biorefinery. So just a brief recapitulation, biorefinery, the utilization or conversion of biomass into energy, chemicals, fuels, and materials, whatever is uh, of interest. Uh, there are different generations. We'll get to that also in a second, as you might or will probably all know. And um, conversion processes here are considered can be either chemical or biomanufacturing process, either by a classic catalysis or by um, fermentation. And xalitol, the product of interest here, uh, that is a sugar substitute with a lot of beneficial health properties. So it's uh, suitable for diabetic nutrition, for example. And in a world where um, we have a growing obesity crisis, this is definitely um, gaining, let's say, more and more interest to, um, to rely on such uh, sugar substitutes. It's also declared by the US Department of Energy as one of the top 12 candidates um, to be produced in a biorefinery. So definitely a um, candidate worth investigating. And then the combination, as said, xalitol biorefinery, we want to produce xalitol as main product with value added co products. Um, we'll get to that also in a second. And then the feedstock here, which we look at, is uh, wheat straw as uh, one of the, um, let's say, the possible feedstocks in terms of um, lignocellulosic biomass. Okay, then um, research question one. There will be three uh, throughout this presentation. So just uh, you have a brief uh, overview about biomass pretreatment. Um, as said, biorefineries can be classified in different ways. Um, here it's done by feedstock. And classically, what you say is a first generation biorefinery is if it utilizes um, crop feed, so basically sugar cane, sugar um, roots, or even uh, corn starch, um, potato starch, um, different uh, possibilities here. But as we also probably all know, there is this heavy food versus fuel debate. If we would produce all the chemicals and all the fuels we need from these crops, it would definitely um, cut short on other sustainable development goals. For example, the eradication of hunger, because there is only a limited amount of uh, space which can be used for the cultivation of these crop plants. And um, this is definitely not uh, sufficient to provide both uh, the, um, the fuel demand of the world and the food demand of the world with, um, with uh, these crops. Then second generation biorefinery is the main focus here, uses a sad lignocellulose biomass, can be agricultural waste, can be um, dedicated non-crop plants or um, forestal biomass, uh, different um, possibilities. But as said, um, the problem here is that the KPIs of this plant usually are not, um, let's say, overwhelmingly good, which is why I said um, the economic feasibility here usually is the, stands diametrically to, um, to the idea of implementing this, and which has led to a low number of them being implemented. And then yeah, third generation or high generation using algae, CO2, or electricity directly to um, to produce. Um, usually here we're talking about low technology readiness levels, so at the moment this is not really something that can be implemented widely in industry yet. Um, from this picture, what remains, let's say, as option is then second generation biorefineries, and in order to use um, the monomers, uh, the sugar monomers, in the different fractions in lignocellulosic biomass for fermentation or for chemical uh, conversion processes, we need to protrude this biomass in order to release the monomers. Pretty simple. Um, there are different, different criteria which uh, need to be applied here. So if we look at the left, we see um, wheat straw in this case as um, the exemplary uh, feedstock here. Um, usually, lignocellulosic biomass has three main fractions, so hemicellulose, uh, cellulose, and lignin, uh, indicated here the fractions which you usually see in wheat straw. And if I want to um, pre-treat this biomass, there are um, different things to watch out for. So first, I want a high monomer yield. So in hemicellulose, cellulose, and lignin, these are both, uh, uh, all the three are polymer, uh, polymeric um, 
yeah, structure, so to say, the hemicellulose and the cellulose were with sugar monomers. And if I want to use that in a fermentation, I need a lot or as many monomers as possible, basically. So um, the yield should be high. Secondly, also a sharp split between the fractions in order to utilize for the respective process uh, stream then later on the, the maximum amount and not to basically um, um, have losses in terms of um, in terms of um, overall operational yield. And thirdly, also what is commonly seen here that you um, form inhibitors uh, as degradation products of these sugar monomers, for example. Um, but here the problem is that um, the following conversion processes, be it a fermentation or a chemical conversion process, can be inhibited by these substances, so their yield should be favorably low. So research question one, which suitable biomass pretreatment method um, technology best fulfill these criteria and how should they be selected? Briefly jumping in here. So as you see on the right, if we start with wheat straw, if we pretreat it, this becomes like a brownish uh, substance. And if you um, use the, the liquid fraction here, the hydrolysate for fermentation, this uh, looks uh, actually pretty much like Coca-Cola, but not like classic fermentation medium. Um, but in order to investigate that, uh, we performed experiments. Um, we selected it here on two different pretreatment methods, A, autothermal pretreatment and B, dilute acid, dilute acid pretreatment. Um, the only difference being basically um, the use of um, uh, dilute acid as catalyst in the second one. Um, and the factors which are the operational variables which you have at hand here to vary is uh, A, the reaction temperature. Um, so which temperature we run the process, then for how long, the reaction time, and C, um, for the dilute acid pretreatment, also the concentration of acid. Um, we um, constructed the design of experiments in a central composite design for the autothermal pretreatment with 11 and for the dilute acid pretreatment with 17 experimental points. And if you analyze all these experiments, what you see is for the autothermal pretreatment uh, for the let's say the highest experimental point, um, the yield is around 10% of the theoretical maximum for um, the target monomer here being xylose. And um, for uh, the dilute acid pretreatment, however, it's above 95% of what is theoretically possible. So this is already a clear indication that if I wanna have um, criterion one fulfilled, I should probably opt for um, the dilute acid pretreatment. Um, we also then constructed a mechanistic model of this. Um, on the left here, given again the three um, fractions with the main, um, let's say, um, polymeric uh, segment. So in the hemicellulose, um, the xylan, which is then converted, for example, to xylose, which is our monomer of interest is set um, for the xylitol production and all the other basically um, depolymerization reactions and uh, then also the degradation reactions. Um, this mechanistic model is based on classically mass and energy balance. Um, in a batch process, this gets pretty simple. So for each um, component here, we, um, we uh, sum up the basically the, the reactions. And for the reaction rates, we have classic and um, first order rate expressions here with um, the parameters which needed, need to be fitted now. So the frequency factor here, AI, the activation energy, EAI, and the reaction order for each of the reactions with which the acid uh, concentration in the dilute, dilute acid pretreatment contributes to the reaction. Um, having done that with a classic uh, parameter estimation based on the experimental points, um, now the uncertainty um, comes into place. So investigating on how well does this model basically, or how robust does it predict, better said. Um, we performed a Monte Carlo-based uh, uncertainty analysis with 1,000 Latin hypercube sample points on the um, basically input space, so the three variables, temperature, time, and acid concentrations. And we verify this um, with, um, well, we don't verify it with all points, but we, we take all the points into consideration. And what you see here, I will take a short minute to explain this to you. Um, on the x-axis, all the experimental points, 1 to 17. And on the y-axis, the xylose um, concentration, uh, so the monomers, which we're interested in. And what you see now is, um, I don't know, do you see my pointer? Probably not. I will um, see if I can um, get one on here. Um, not really annotate. Okay, I will just walk you through it like, uh, like this. So what you see is, um, the small black points is basically measurements that are excluded from the parameter estimation. The large white points are um, the points included in the um, parameter estimation and the large black dots 4.4 and 0.9 are used for validation purposes. So the model has not seen them before just to verify basically if the model predicts well. 
And these little violins, which you can see now, is for the 1,000 realizations of uncertainty, the predictions of the model. And what we see is that for basically all um, validation points, the model predicts pretty well. And also for the, um, the two test points, 0.4 and 0.9, uh, the model prediction is actually pretty close to what is seen in the experiments. On the other hand, what we see for lower concentrations here with the small points, which are excluded, the model doesn't predict too well, which is also why we, um, we excluded these points, basically with the rationale being that we, given to the criteria, want to have a high monomer yield. So where the model needs to predict well is for areas where the concentration is high. Uh, re so reversely, we can allow that uh, for lower concentrations, the model doesn't predict that well. As long as we know it, this is fine. Um, and yeah, basically the consequence is for high concentrations, we predict well. Um, oh. Is uh, the presentation stuck? No. Okay, conclusions. Um, so what we saw from the experiments, there's a key preference for the dilute asset pretreatment. Um, the mechanistic model validates pretty well, also regarding the robustness, as we just saw. Um, so the choice of pretreatment here um, was good due to the high yield. And um, well, the model evaluation here, and uh, basically what we, what we get with these 95% uh, monomer yields is um, that uh, basically our mechanistic model can predict this very well. So we should use it later on um, for process design uh, purposes. Um, this uh, work has been published in uh, the following paper on the right in the chemical engineering journal. So if anybody's interested, um, feel free to give it a read. Uh, in collaboration with people from DTU Bioengineering, the group of Solange Musata there, um, and also from DTU Biosustain. Um, okay, second research question, the techno-economic analysis now. So um, basically for the pretreatment, we developed a model here. We did that also for all the other um, potentially involved unit operations, so to say. I will get to that in a second also. Um, but first, let me give you a brief overview on this um, techno-economic analysis aspect. As I mentioned before, usually the economic, uh, let's say, um, potential of these biorefineries is well, not necessarily good or um, fishery, if you want. Um, so if we go, for example, the database here of the European Technology and Bioinnovation Platform, um, what we see on the right here now is um, they list 312 biorefinery projects, uh, of which a third, so 162, are um, on commercial scale. Um, the other ones are in pilot plants or, or other projects. And if we take this third of uh, this third, then one fourth again, only 54 are then operating. The other ones are in commission under construction or even decommissioned. And uh, then again, of this fourth, so only 30 left, um, they use lignocellulosic cellulosic biomass. The rest is um, based on biogas or other um, substrates. And if we then think about, okay, as we said before, it can be maybe not the best idea to um, produce bioethanol, are they producing anything else, chemicals, for example, we see that at least in this database, but in other databases, it doesn't look much better. There is basically none to very few lignocellulosic biorefineries that produce bioethanol, uh, that produce other pro products in bioethanol. Um, so yeah, once again, highlighting here that there is a discrepancy between the idea of how well this let's say whole setup of um, utilizing second generation biomass uh, can work to what we see in industry in terms of implemented biorefinery processes. So in order to conceptually design such a process, we, um, well, ask, ask, ask the question, can such a conceptually designed uh, biorefinery be a cost competitive alternative to an existing chemical process? And what products should be um, produced in such a setup? So, um, I said we need a way to conceptually design this and then do a techno-economic analysis to see whether that actually works out. Um, the framework which we developed here um, is based on um, three different strategies. So basically in the first step, we select um, products um, which should be produced and um, then basically unit operation models for the production. Uh, the idea is to begin basically with the end in mind um, to have a bottom-up design of a superstructure in order to perform superstructure optimization. So we select a set of suitable set of products, develop mechanistic models, and assess the robustness as explained. Then superstructure optimization is done here not in the basically classical sense of finding a globally optimal solution, but rather to um, screen or to analyze for alternative um, 
process structures. So we determine basically a set of candidate process topologies, which then are worth further um, investigating. So um, this is done here in the following way. You, we perform flow sheet simulations with the original models, which we have created. Um, we uh, create surrogate models, we calibrate them and we cross validate them in order to ensure that they actually predict well. And then with these circuit models, we formulate an optimization problem um, and solve this underlying um, optimization problem then for um, several candidate process topologies, as said. And uh, then the third step is based on simulation-based optimization. Um, so what we do is basically we consolidate design, including uncertainty. We define uncertain inputs can be, I don't know, in the, in the, in the sizing of the equipment, uh, you name it, just uh, anything's possible. And then we perform uh, simulation-based optimization with a stochastic Kriegen-based solver for all the candidates, which we found in the second step. Um, in order to find an optimal design, we validate with the original flow sheets, and then we should have an optimal process solution. So step one, in order to select products, feed second processes, as said, um, Ligma cellulose biomass has three fractions. The first one, hemicellulose, we wanted to produce xylitol. Um, second, I have to remove the little screen here where I see participants, otherwise I don't see what I'm presenting. Um, <laughs> so um, as I said, we wanted to produce xylitol. It's in yeast, it's a natural uh, metabolite. It's a one-step conversion from the uptake of xylose, so the monomer from the pretreatment, um, catabolically repressed by glucose. That's a specification for the model, but basically you can use wild type uh, yeast organisms um, apart from Saccharomyces, so the classic yeast for that, um, or you engineer yourself factory. Second, then for the hemisphere, uh, for the cellulose, we also want to utilize that to not throw away uh, feedstock. We want to produce succinic acid, which is also one of the top 12 candidates to be produced in a biorefinery. And um, it's a metabolite in the TCA cycle in bacteria and yeast. And uh, the process requires net CO2 uptake. So basically, the process reaction um, demands that we feed CO2 to the fermentation, which is good because then, for example, in fossil or in processes where there is an emission of fossil CO2, we combine this CO2 and take it then into the succinic acid fermentation and um, basically capture CO2 in a way. Um, also different strains possible, either wild type or engineered cell factories. And then the last one, the lignin, uh, doesn't consist of sugar monomers, but aromatic um, monomer, alcohol monomer, so to say. Uh, what we can do here is two things. Either we um, go via fast pyrolysis and a hydro treatment um, to end up with a product which is similar to um, kerosene. Um, with a, a bit higher aromatic content, but still you can use it as a blend in fuel to make aviation more sustainable, which would be good. Otherwise we can combust the entire lignin fraction in order to provide heat as a process integration um, measure in order to uh, make the process more, um, yeah, um, or have a, a lower net energy demand. Um, so what we look at now is the full superstructure, which we want to analyze. We say we want to, um, process 150,000 tons per year of wheat straw. And what we see then, wheat straw goes in, we have this pretreatment as mentioned, dilute acid, and then um, we basically have the first fraction going off for the exhalator process train. We can either increase the concentration by an evaporation step here or go directly into the fermentation. Um, we convert our monomers into the xylitol, our product of interest, and then we have a facultative evaporation step to increase, again, the, the concentration of the product to remove the water content, um, and then crystallization step one and optionally crystallization step two to end up with our product. Then for the, um, the other two fractions, we then perform an enzymatic hydrolysis in order to break down the, the cellulose into monomers, uh, and then similar setup is for the um, for the hemicellulose process strain, either up concentrate or not, fermentation, and then the same downstream. And for the lignin process strain, as said, we have um, either the option of process it into aviation fuel, or we combust it and then have uh, heat as a product, which you can use for process integration. Okay, and um, as said now, we, we use this framework. We, um, we um, want to build surrogate models in order to perform a superstructure optimization. So what we do now is uh, first step core sampling. So we check um, out of these options, which one are actually worth investigating. So what is the criterion here is just to basically reduce the problem size. We check are actually all of these options, 128 in total on the y-axis, um, able to produce both xylitol and succinic acid as our two main products. Um, and what we see set on the y-axis is all these um, options. And on the x-axis, we see all the unit operations, which are um, included in the superstructure. Yellow means uh, unit operation is present. Blue means is not present. And what we see on the right in the bar now is um, in blue, whether this 
um, flow sheet option is not able to produce both or yellow if it is. And um, so this step was actually really useful to do because we see most of the process options actually don't, don't fulfill the purpose. So we can omit them in further steps. So what we focus on is the, these um, four, yellow, four little yellow slots in total 16 options, which we can then further analyze. As I said, we build surrogate models, validate them. That's a different story. Um, also published work. So if you want, you can have a more detailed read or ask, a, ask, ask me questions. Um, the superstructure optimization at the end, we predict um, as an um, objective function, the net present value. So key performance indicator, including CapEx and OpEx calculations um, in order to see whether this process is actually feasible of uh, being economically yeah, beneficial. Um, for all the feasible options, so all the yellow ones, uh, which you saw on the, on the last slide, and we validate, of course, with the original model to see whether our optimization predicts properly. And what we see here now for um, three different surrogate models, so blue, green, and yellow, um, on the y-axis, the net present value, and on the x-axis, all the different options which we had uh, for investigation, we see that... Um, some of them are actually able to um, produce economically uh, feasible, so to say. And um, what we see now, if we compare the, um, the results with the validation simulation, so what you see here where the white circle means that it didn't validate and with the black circle that it did validate so that the, the model actually, the optimization predicts what the, the model predicts originally. We see that mostly here option one, two, three, four, uh, nine and 10, and also here, um, 18, etc. They work. Not all the surrogate models perform equally well, um, but uh, we have some options which we can further investigate. So what we will do, we will take option two, option four, option 10, and option 18 to um, perform basically the last step and to do the techno-economic analysis. Um, what we take now is, um, or what we need now actually, is the uh, market prices. Um, this is um, well a difficult topic because it's usually not very easy to get this information. Um, so we um, went ahead and um, looked into some business reports for um, both products, the succinic acid and the xalitol, um, with price data from the past five years, um, yearly average prices, and we tried to fit different distributions here. Um, the market volumes, just for your information, for Xalitol, that's around 200,000 tons uh, globally per year, and for succinate acid, around 50,000 tons. And what we see um, in order to basically um, yeah, fit a, a price distribution with all the five investigated here, be it uniform, be it log normal, be it extreme value, they fit equally well or equally bad if you want. So there is no real major difference in terms of which distribution to use for the uncertainty analysis. Um, so we went ahead here with the normally distributed uh, prices. And um, as I said, we have four flow sheet options, which we investigate, two, four, 10, and 18. We again perform 1,000 uh, Latin hypercube samples. And um, as I said, we now include uncertainty according to class five estimates for this uh, conceptual process design for the fixed capital investment. So the, um, the capex of the plant basically being either 50% cheaper or 100% more expensive. Um, the total production cost, so the OPEX being 20% more cheap or 50% uh, more expensive in the, in the extreme cases. And for the prices, uh, oh, actually uniform distribution is not normal, sorry, um, in the actual price ranges. So for Xalitol around 4.5 to 5.5 dollars per kilogram and for succinic acid around 3.2 dollars per kilogram. And what we see for the four flow sheet options on the x-axis, um, the minimum selling price on the y-axis, you see this little uh, gray line um, is the current market price for xalitol. If we fix the succinic acid price, we see for the realizations of uncertainty that um, for this violin plot, everything that's above the gray line means not feasible. Everything below means feasible for all the realizations of uncertainty. So if you look at the failure rates on the right, for the most beneficial, let's say, setup for option two, we see that the investment will fail in 60% of the cases. Even worse for option 10, the green uh, one, 96% of the cases fail, which is, again, confirming the picture, but definitely not good if you want to implement such a process. Um, I see I don't have too much time left, so quickly conclusions. The choice of products was reasonable, so both um, say potential uh, candidates here, or all the three. The lignin combustion here, I didn't go into detail, is more beneficial for the KPIs than the kerosene production, which is why that is basically then excluded later on. Framework performance is similar as predicted, so that also works out. Um, 
correct price distribution doesn't have a major influence, so to say. And um, we can confirm, as shown in the last figure, techno-economic feasibility overall is fragile, unfortunately. Um, this is all so published work uh, regarding the framework. This is an article uh, together with a um, former PhD now working at Novo Nordisk, uh, Rezul in Frontiers of Chemical Science and Engineering and the actual techno-economic analysis then um, did go into an article in Frontiers in Chemical Engineering. Um, also feel free to give it a read in case of um, further interest. Then quickly, the last question, is it then more sustainable? So the three existing, um, or no, two existing um, production processes for xylitol already, first one run by IFF um, based on wood biomass and plugged into a pulp and paper mill um, using a side stream there. Then the second one based on corn cob, which is run by, for example, Cargill and uh, other producers, for example, in China. Um, also uh, chemical production route, both of them. And then we have as a comparison, our process, which we designed based on wheat straw, but uh, running with fermentation instead. Question three here then, is the second generation biorefinery more sustainable than the alternative chemical process and can it play a key role in the transition towards more sustainable production patterns? Um, this um, sustainability analysis or life cycle assessment is a standardized, a standardized procedure within ISO norm. Uh, so you first define the goal and scope of your analysis. You um, basically decide you need life cycle inventory. So meaning you balance your um, flows, which go in and out of the system, material, energy, emissions, etc., And then you assess the impact of um, each of the inventory items with um, an impact assessment method. Here we use the recipe 2016 midpoint H method. And then um, these characterization factors all come from the Ecron 3 database. And then when you're done with that, you interpret your results. Uh, sensitivity analysis, for example, is possible to see what has most influence or just an, a visual assessment, basically. Um, so again, um, we want to compare both the environmental impacts and whether our biotechnological process is more basically sustainable than the existing chemical ones. Uh, the scope is cradle to gate. So basically when you chop the wheat straw off the field um, until the xylitol comes out of the plant. Reference scheme then here is one ton per year of wheat straw compared to 150,000 ton uh, capacity. Functional unit then is the production of xylitol of the mass which comes out. And um, again, just to show you, this is the flow sheet. Um, we do our um, inventorization basically, so we calculate everything that um, should go into the assessment. So we, uh, we need wheat straw for the production, this needs to be transported for dilute acid pretreatment, you need, for example, sulfuric acid for, um, for um, the process, etc. For the fermentation, you have different requirements and also overall, you need process water, cooling water, steam, electricity, etc. Um, for the wastewater treatment, which is um, attached to the process, um, emits basically a salt solution, brine, and there are ashes from the lignin combustion, and so on. With all these um, inventory items um, basically uh, listed, then we can do the impact assessment as set with the recipe 2016 uh, midpoint H um, method here. And what we see is now. Um, the relative impact. So for all 18 categories, which go into this recipe um, recipe method, um, we see, for example, global warming on the very left. Um, what has most influence here is actually the waste brine, um, a little bit the steam and the electricity. For other categories, it's actually mostly the electricity, which has the highest relative impact. And if we normalize that now with a, um, with a normalization point, so the basically sustainability footprint of a, a global average citizen, which is one of the reference points you can use here, you see that um, the categories which are actually, so to say, most influential are not the CO2 because we basically don't emit any fossil CO2. So in terms of global warming, this process actually runs very well. Um, what has um, the most or the highest normalized um, impact is the freshwater ecotoxicity, the marine ecotoxicity, and the human carcinogenic toxicity, which is why actually um, attributable to the electricity, as we saw in the, in the prior slide, um, because if you take, for example, renewable electricity, the windmills in, um, if you take Denmark as an exemplary location, there is copper in there. And if you don't recycle the copper, but take it from copper mines in the global south, um, if the waste management system there doesn't work well, the toxic chemicals from these mines then actually poison marine life, which is a little bit far-fetched maybe even, but uh, definitely worth uh, knowing about if you wanna do a sustainability assessment here. Um, 
Okay, just quickly to wrap up, I compared these um, the Salator biorefinery with the other two processes. And what we see here in green, the DuPont process actually has the, the best metrics, uh, the Corncom process overall worst, ours ranks um, second, but um, overall the magnitudes are similar, so there is no real say in one is more better, uh, one is better than the other. They all rank more or less in the same level. Um, also, the comparison is not straightforward because I use simulation data and the other ones stem from actual plants. Um, and I said, well, the global warming impact is low, toxicity impacts are comparatively high. Um, and what we see here, quantification is important to see effects, for example, which electricity has, which was not expected before. Um, also, uh, work which is currently in preparation, but should be submitted soon. And um, without uh, further ado, ah, yeah, well, but this is also all part of my PhD thesis, if you're interested. This is already available through the um, library of DTU. Um, short conclusions. So the results of this work show um, potential of this process. Um, producing things, for example, with a biotechnological process instead of a chemical, although we're not there yet. The techno-economical feasibility is not promising. Um, what we should do is maybe include both value chain optimization and also cell fracture optimization in order to make this process a bit more, let's say, um, less iterative. Um, and what we see here is a clear importance of quantifying things, um, this model-based uh, analysis, and also including the uncertainty here in decision-making, because that actually helps revealing things which are not um, evident, let's say, at first sight. Also, to get back to these um, problem fields of McKinsey, more collaboration, pragmatism, and political support would definitely be helpful in terms of implementing this. And yeah, what we saw, basically, second-generation biorefineries might not work for now from an economical point of view, these fermentation processes in their do. So um, in the end, having the, the end in mind, so to say again, whatever, let's say, solution works best in order to get us to more sustainable uh, production patterns, we should go for that. Is it then by the use of biomass? Maybe, but as long as um, we reach these goals, I think uh, we are all good to go. With that, I would like to conclude. Um, contact details on the left, thanking Gurkan and Chris again, my two PhD supervisors and all the other collaborators. And of course, also the Novo Nordisk Foundation for funding. And if you have questions, I would be happy to take them. Thank you very much for your kind presentation. Very interesting. Uh, I don't see questions in the chat. Uh, I have one for you. Uh, yes. Uh, during the fermentation for the production of succinic acid, do you mm -hmm. you don't have uh, byproducts? The uh, there are byproducts. So what I consider here in the model is um, formic and acetic acid, and um, there is also a um, basically um, accumulated term for the inhibition due to the falling pH of the production. So um, in if you want to improve this process in a way, you should. Um, also take into account with the pretreatment because you also form these two metabolites already there that you aim for low levels for the acids there. And then um, if you want to optimize basically the process or the cell factory, you then could target, for example, an irrational design approach in order to make the strain more resistant to lower pH uh, values to produce more of your product. Um, and then, of course, in the downstream process, then the question is... Um, how well do you separate these? But um, for example, in the evaporation, you already get rid of most of the acetic acid. So um, overall, the setup works, but there's definitely also room for improvement, yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Well, if there are no further questions, I think I give the floor back to Julia and Martin. Okay, yes, <laughs> there are no other questions. So we can conclude our talks. Today we had uh, very interesting presentations on biomass uses for the production of renewables, chemicals and fuels. Uh, this research field is very large and challenging, as you can see from the presentation. Our working party is very active, both in simulation and optimization of these processes. Uh, a lot of work, however, is already to be done for developing effective and sustainable processes. Uh, I don't know if uh, the other speakers want to add something to this uh, discussion. I think that uh, we have to, to find sy synergies also with other fields and, uh, and multidisciplinarity also, <laughs> this, because this field requires a lot of uh, knowledge in different fields.
So some of you want to add something? Or well, maybe I may say that it was a very nice morning and many thanks for your work. I think that uh, Cape is uh, one of the prestigious working parties of, um, of uh, EFC and we are very, very happy that uh, you are on the board and that uh, the work which has been done so far is, is absolutely excellent. So thank you very much for doing this. Please continue. <laughs> and also to the speakers, it was, uh, it was very, again, uh, very, very uh, non-homogeneous in, 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 the, in, the, in, the, in the best possible meaning of this expression, right? So, so it was enjoyable, great morning. Uh, so, so from my point of view, definitely, uh, Martin would agree. Thank you very much for, for putting this together. Thanks a lot. And to all, to your guys, to, to all of you for, for, for contributing and of course to, to the audience. Um, okay. Thank you very much. I hope also to, that in the future we could find some uh, uh, collaboration with the other working parties because uh, really this field is involving uh, a lot of uh, knowledge and uh, specialties. Okay, so we can conclude our spotting light talks. Uh, I thank uh, to all, all the speakers for their interesting presentations and I hope to you, all of you, a good, good luck <laughs> and uh, a good health uh, relating to the, our uh, situation. Okay, thank you very much to all of you. Thank you very much and have a nice day. Have a nice Bye. Day.